Welcome. I'm Paul Chin, Director of Missional Engagement, and I'm so glad you've joined us. You are most likely watching this on our Watch Now page, which we have set up so that you can explore and find most information in one place. From there, you can navigate ways to get involved, connect with others, and be praying. If you're looking for more details on our community, events, and upcoming experiences, be sure to check out this page. There are a couple of events I want to highlight for you. There's still time to sign up for our coldest night of the year and raise support for people who are facing challenges right here in Waterloo Region. This family-friendly walking fundraiser is a great way to mobilize and provide practical support for people who are hungry and homeless. And it couldn't be easier to participate. Sign up, invite your people, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and have them donate to the cause. And then pick a time that's convenient for you to do your walk right in your own neighborhood. The dollars we raise will support our friends at Ray of Hope, who do amazing ministry amongst marginalized people in KW. Get the details and sign up at wbchurch.ca slash c-n-o-t-y, coldest night of the year. Our current message series, Relationship with the Church, wraps up next week, and the season of Lent begins. Lent is a season in the church calendar that is the 40 days before Easter. And so we'll be turning our focus to preparing for Easter. We invite you to participate in what we're calling the Road to Hope. These will be weekly prayer and reflection exercises that walk us through the gospel. We're putting together kits with tactile elements to help us engage and we'll be hosting weekly Zoom calls on Mondays leading up to Easter starting February 22nd. And these will walk us through these prayer exercises together. The Road to Hope is for all members of the household, from kids to seniors, and you can feel free to engage with the kid on your own, but we'd love if you joined us together in community for virtual prayer and reflection times on Mondays. In these days, we can journey together and follow a thread that will lead us from desolation to hopefulness. These prayer exercises will be a means to experience and reflect on heaven-touching earth, like we talked about last week. All you have to do to receive a kit is sign up and indicate if and when you can pick it up. Visit wmbchurch.ca slash hope to do that. We're now going to have a time of musical worship. I encourage you to find a posture that will help you engage with the Lord, whether it's standing, sitting, or kneeling, whether you turn up the volume and sing out loud or quietly reflect. The Holy Spirit is with you, empowering your praise, along with a community of other believers, both near and far. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the way that you bring hope into this world. Thank you that, that you bring light and life to us. And so Jesus, would you empower our praise, empower our worship, so that we could worship together as a church community and sense your presence with us. Holy Spirit, Sing through us, pray through us, and we want to celebrate you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us today, and welcome. We're so glad that you've chose to join us, and we have this opportunity today. This song declares that we have a choice to make, and we will choose to praise, to lift up the name of the Lord, God Most High. There's no one else like him. And so today I encourage you, would you join your hearts? Would you lift your voice, raise your hands, sing for joy for the Lord our God as we choose to declare him worthy of all our praise. Let's sing together. Same God is never 
God calls us to bring all we have to him in worship, our time, talents, and our treasure. Thank you so much for the ways you continue to support the work and ministry of WB Church. If you'd like to give electronically, you can use the links on our webpage or in our app. If you have a physical offering, please drop it off at the church or mail it to the church office. We're now going to hear a message in our series on relationship with the church. Chris, Christy, Michelle, and Sarah will share about how men and women can fully participate together as equals in the church. I'm very excited to listen to them, but we want to caution parents that at the beginning of the message, Chris talks briefly about temptation that can occur between men and women, so parental guidance is advised. Grab a journal, coffee, whatever you need to get ready, let's prepare and lean into what God has for us. Welcome. You're in for a treat today. We have a series of dynamic speakers and leaders that are going to share with me in this message from our team and really preach the message of equality for all people with me, which is a topic we're addressing in our devotional this week. At WMB, we believe that men and women both have gifts to fully offer the body of Christ in any and every role in the church, that we are better together in leadership. That is the starting place of our conversation today. For me, this conversation is one that I've been part of for a long time. Growing up, I marched on Parliament Hill in Ottawa with my mom and family for equal rights and pay for women. Do you know that in 1980, when the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms was written, that Canada didn't have anything about including women until people actually protested? I still remember in the late 80s, marching on Parliament Hill for job equity that came in to my workplace in 1994. Did you know that there's still a 13% wage gap in Canada for white women and 35% wage gap for indigenous and racialized women and a 46% wage gap for women with disabilities? Some of the greatest bosses I've had were women. I've mentored female leaders, been mentored by female leaders, and I've learned from and sit under great speakers that are women all my life. I am, though, embarrassed to say that my post-secondary education did include many readings from female authors, but I have expanded my library in this way over the last number of years. With two daughters, I want to be part of the conversation to create every opportunity for them to use the giftedness that God has given them in whatever way God would choose to lead them. Sadly, in this journey of mentoring and being mentored by women, both in the church and in secular business, there can always be comments that people make along the journey. Because for some reason, there is a belief that men and women cannot be friends or colleagues because sex is always going to get in the way somehow. 
Some churches actually enshrined a rule because of something Billy Graham did in the 60s in his traveling ministry to protect himself from temptation and to reduce the potential appearance of him cheating on his spouse. He created what has been known as the Billy Graham rule. And that is that men should never mentor women or be alone with them because of the appearance of evil. Now, I don't mean any disrespect to Billy Graham or the wisdom he had in protecting his public image as a global evangelist when many televised preachers in his day were discrediting the gospel witness by falling into temptation. In a time where men and women grew up with clearly defined social roles and the sexualization of women was normal, there was and can be wisdom in the heart behind this principle. Today, sadly, many Christians are still falling into these stereotypes. And just like today, in the time of the Apostle Paul, Greek philosophers saw people as a sum of their urges. We seem to think that way today, that men and women couldn't be friends, so to speak, that sexual tension would always be a problem. In fact, hunger, thirst, sleep, and sex were seen as urges for the Greeks that we could not control and needed, had to fulfill. So let's look at how the Apostle Paul addresses this worldview in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20. It says this to us. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, and he will raise us also. But you not know that our bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and untie them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul doesn't just say, yeah, this worldview is true. Just flee at all times. No, he actually confronts this worldview, challenging people to live for a higher purpose than just fulfilling their urges. He claims our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, the place where the very presence of God dwells, because he is trying to elevate our thinking. He was trying to elevate their thinking. There is more to life than the next fix or giving in to our urges. We're meant for much more. We are called to sexual purity, to even flee any temptation. But the idea or view that every brother or sister in Christ that we are friends with, we cannot control our urges with, simply was not his point here. There is wisdom if you're struggling with temptation with an individual to move away from that individual, from the temptation that you might be facing. Maybe even as a world-renowned Christian celebrity, Billy Graham needed to have greater boundaries, guardrails that protect them from going too far in any relationship that they could have a struggle in. But to blanket across every relationship that you have with the opposite sex, and some might argue with even the same sex for, sex for others, just cannot be true if Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit that lives in us calls us to a higher standard in life and worldview that we are just the sum of our urges. Hopefully, as followers of Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, we believe and can have friends that are men or women and see them as brothers or sisters in Christ and not feel like we are constantly navigating temptation. Because we are not the sum of our urges, as Paul says. We are created for much more. For far too long, male Christian leaders have used the Billy Graham rule not to mentor women, be mentored by women, or even have female leadership in the room at times. But this is so sad to me. John w Maxwell, in his book, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, points out that it takes a leader to produce a leader. That without mentors in your life, no one becomes a great leader. 
So I hope today's message from three incredible women on our staff will remind all of us of the benefit of learning from both men and women in the faith. Christy is going to teach why there's an incomplete picture of the Godhead when male and female leaders aren't mentoring each other. Michelle will teach about how men and women complement each other and that we are better together. And Sarah will ultimately teach that there is no place for those who are in Christ Jesus to see men and women as unequal. As a privileged white man, I can learn a lot from how Jesus used his position as a rabbi in the Jewish culture, a man in a seat of power to empower the marginalized and show what it means to give away power, even discipling women in a day and age that frowned on it. If you're a Christian leader, you cannot ignore our role to use that leadership to serve and empower others, whether you're a man or a woman. The two people I've learned the most about leadership from in my life are women. One has an incredible leader who led tourism programs in high schools in every province and territory in Canada and 27 nations around the world. 850 leaders flew in from around the world to my mom's retirement party. That's the leader I'm speaking of. Both men and women from all over the world flew in and celebrated the impact of her mentorship in their life. The other one is my wife, Adrienne, who is the managing director of Cochrane Canada, helping or trying to help government and other leaders make evidence-based decisions right now on things like the COVID-19 crisis. Godly women who are great leaders have taught me a ton, and I assume you as well. So this morning, I want you to learn from three women of many on our staff team that I've learned a ton from in my almost seven years now at WMB. Christy Penner-Warden, Michelle Knowles, and Sarah White. Thanks, Chris. There's a new book on the shelves about a year old called You're the Girl for the Job. It's written by a Christian woman for Christian women. I don't want to need this book. I don't want my sisters to sigh with relief, finally, at the sight of it. I'm not sure I want my daughters to need to read it. But it does exist, and the felt need is real. Why is that? Does a man need a book called, You're the Dude for the Job? Why not? And if he does, I don't like that either. There are some conversations that you know God has something to say about, but you might feel fuzzy on where he lands. Maybe it's the theology you grew up with, your family of origin. Maybe it's the opinions of authors or even fellow Christians. But whenever opinion or theology doesn't align with the character and nature of God, it's cause for pause. Because the character and nature of God are actually really clear in Scripture. And sometimes Scripture isn't clear. There are issues in today's world that aren't specifically addressed in Scripture. And so we need to trust wisdom and discernment in community to fill in the gaps. But the equality of men and women is not one such issue. I believe God was really clear in scripture from the very beginning about the equity of man and woman as image bearers. When I say very beginning, let's look at Genesis 1. Verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. Let's take a look at the parts of this passage that are easily missed if we only look at the literal meaning in the English translation. 
Verse 26, God said, let us, us. This is an early and important reference God is making to his own triune nature. They are three in unity as one. And they want us to look like them. The word man is a crude translation. The Hebrew word is Adam and not with a capital A. And it doesn't directly or specifically mean man as in masculine, singular, human. It actually means of the earth or human. This is important. God then says they will rule after saying Adam. If the translation is man, then this should say he will rule, not they. But the Hebrew does not allow for a masculine singular translation. Also, it's important not to rush past this beautiful parallel. God as us. Humanity as us. Both are plural. This matters to how we read and interpret our re relationship and roles one to another. Let's look at verse 27. The language of he, man, singular versus plural is poetic here. Image is singular. So we have returned to the singular unified image of God, Elohim. Him, in line two of the poem, is the crude English again, reflective of the use of the word man, not reflective of masculine or feminine intention. Notice the turn of phrase in the last line. He created them, male and female. He created Adam, human, male and female. God's image is the collected reflection of image bearers, male and female. Female is not a tab on a diversity spreadsheet. Female is half of all diversity. Female is half of humanity. Female is half of the collected mosaic of the image of God. It's crucial to add here that according to the language of scripture, it takes both man and woman, or put in another way, humankind as a whole, to reflect God's image in a complete way. In other words, it wouldn't be quite right to assert that you or I or Billy Graham or Mother Teresa as individuals are adequate to the task of giving the world a balanced, well-rounded picture of his nature and glory. Instead, each one of us is a piece in a huge mosaic, and the mosaic as a whole includes both masculine and feminine features. Equity is what unity looks like, agreement around scripture that I am who he says I am without caveats based on my sex. Inequity as image bearers is a caveat for division. Inequity gives permission to elevate one reflection of the image of God over another as if his image could even be possibly contained or conceived in one person by so doing. Until every image bearer claims status as child of God, we will never contain let alone comprehend his collective beauty. His image cannot be limited by the boxes we impose on it. Although it's true that God has revealed himself in the Bible as a father who has many masculine traits, this isn't quite the same as saying that he is a male God in the style of Zeus or Apollo. 
If you have trouble grasping this, remember that while the Lord is a personal God, he is neither human nor sexual in nature. Men and women may be different in many important ways, but they are both created in the image of God. There are beautiful pictures in scripture as well, where God is described by female characteristics, such as Hosea 13, 8, when God is described as a mother bear, or in Deuteronomy 32, where God is described as a mother eagle. How Isaiah described God as a mother who comforts her child in Isaiah 66, 13, or in the Gospels where Jesus' disciples described God as a mother hen in Matthew 23, 37, or Luke 13, 34. These verses about the creation of man and woman, when taken in harmony with the rest of the teaching of scripture, convey the oneness of male and female humans as equal bearers of the image of God and equal in status before God, equally able to have a personal relationship with God. So my question is, what do we miss out on in the image of the creator when we decide who's included? What, rather who, is missing from the conversation when we decide that man meant men and they hold privilege to open his word, teach scripture, lead in the boardroom, become a CEO, or even express the gifts of the Holy Spirit? My fear is not that a table of only men is missing my voice. My disappointment is that such a table only ever has the potential to hold 50% of the image of God, no matter how many men are seated at it. And 50% just doesn't feel worth settling for to me. Further, a woman doesn't represent women. She represents one tile in the mosaic of the glorious image of God. Each of us, we are one piece of a beautiful picture of the body of Christ. So who's missing from your table? Who have you decided isn't invited? And how does that witness to God's image as a result? All that we do and the way we reflect his image out to the world around us tells a story of who we believe he is. Let's make sure that the image we convey looks like who he says he is, according to his word. Thanks, Christy. What a beautiful picture of how we all need to be at the table an invitation to partner together in order to fully express the image of God. As a young ministry leader and pastor, I am so deeply thankful for other leaders, men and women, who have impacted and shaped me, who have offered coaching and encouragement, who have modeled a life of faith and invited me alongside them into spaces of ministry and leadership. Most of all, I am thankful for the gift of serving together with Adam, as in my husband, who is literally named Adam, not the Adam Christie referred to from Genesis. Adam, my husband, is truly my partner in life and ministry. For us, marriage is a commitment to partnership in life and mission. In fact, the vows we spoke to one another on our wedding day started with the following sentence. I take you to be my husband and wife, secure in the knowledge that you will be my helpmate, my constant friend and one true love. In our vows, we covenanted to doing life side by side, with trust, honor, and respect for one another, to encourage and strengthen one another's faith with the desire to see God glorified through our marriage. Our vows came from Genesis chapter two in the King James Version. This is the second account in the creation story when God created Adam and Eve. We love the vision of God creating Adam, giving him a purpose and mission in the world, but recognizing that he was not designed to do this alone. He needed a partner, a helpmate, or a suitable helper to serve with him. In Genesis chapter two, we read, 
the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And then we see further down. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God created Eve as that perfect partner for him to serve together in the calling God had given them. Christy has explained the collective meaning of Adam in scripture. They were created to steward and care for his creation together in the world in which he had placed them. For Adam and I, the commitment to be a helpmeet or helpmate is a relationship of equal and mutual partnership reflected in the creation story in Genesis. God has called each of us into pastoral ministry and he called us together. From the earliest days of our relationship, we shared a heart and vision for serving in mission, and God has invited us into different spaces to lead together over the years, in family missions in camp, with soccer teams, and now as WMB pastors. In our first years of marriage, Adam was an incredible support as I finished seminary studies and pursued God's call into vocational ministry. And now I've had the privilege to reciprocate this and support Adam as he followed God's ministry call. We are each other's first and greatest advocate and encourager. Serving together as equals means that we each trust and affirm the other to lead and that we submit to one another as partners. Chris talked about Ephesians 5.21 the other week, the call to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is something that Adam and I continue to practice. We read scripture and pray together. We speak truth and love to one another. We affirm each other and hold one another accountable in mutual submission, even having those difficult conversations to help lead each other closer to Jesus. Let me be clear. We can also disagree with one another and we can argue. There are many times we hold different opinions. As many of you know, we each have a very different understanding of time. You know, we can pastor a church together, but we cannot load the dishwasher together. We get to practice lots of forgiveness with one another. We are regular people, humans living after the fall in a broken world, but choosing to pursue together God's redemptive vision and living in light of his kingdom. I am so grateful that I've been given the opportunity to use my gifts as a pastor here at WMB. I'm thankful to be in a healthy marriage in which I'm an equal partner where we see our marriage as God bringing us together to live out his purpose for his church. I recognize, though, that this is not the experience of everyone. For many different reasons, others have not been given that opportunity. And this is something we need to strive towards as the church, allowing God to bring us healing as his people, stretching us and bringing us into ever greater alignment with his perfect way for us. While this is a story of marriage, I believe that this vision of equal partnership is God's call for all of us in the church, in the workplace, in every sphere of life. We live in light of God's kingdom as God brings his redemptive work into the world, restoring what was broken in creation. Ever since the moment of original sin by Adam and Eve, in Genesis chapter 3, God has promised and been working towards healing and restoration. We live in the already not yet we live as a foretaste of a heavenly kingdom while still in a broken world, pursuing that original perfect vision of creation. This invitation to equal partnership is for all of us as his church family. This is the vision of heaven that Paul Chin taught about last week. As God brings his people together as equal partners in his church, he is calling us to create space for each person to serve and contribute according to the perfect and beautiful ways that God has created each one of us as his dearly loved children. Thanks, Michelle. We are all called to equality in every space in our life. So let me expand on what Christy and Michelle are saying from the New Testament, from the letter of Paul to a church in Galatia, from Galatians 3, 26 to 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. See, these verses can be easy to move through with some speed. 
They're full of churchy, feel-good language. Children of God, baptized, clothe yourself with Christ. And sometimes we can read them quickly with a sure, 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 that, that again kind of feeling. And we miss just how incredible they really are. See, the passage that I'm looking at today from Galatians is a long way from the Genesis account that Michelle and Christy read from. A long way from Abraham's family. A slightly less long way from the life and times of Jesus. We find ourselves here with the early church, with a letter that Paul, a key leader of that time, wrote to these people who lived and loved and worked in a city called Galatia. And as with any letter of Paul, I always, always ask, why would he have written this down? Why would he have, in the effort of writing, when pens and paper were not cheap or free or readily available, bothered to have mentioned this? See, we're the ones who squim. We're the ones who read fast. We're the ones who think we know. But friends, at one point, these were physical words written on a page in ink that a community gathered and lovingly shared. They weren't small typed words in a 1,000 page book. They weren't a throwaway. So let's pay attention to them. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So let's start at the beginning there. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized with Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You have clothed yourself with Christ. See, we might think that this isn't true as true today, but it is. Clothing reveals much of who we are. It might have been more acute in the time of Paul, where certain garments representing certain industries and wealth levels, but this still exists today. It absolutely does. We can make a series of decisions about a person based on their clothing. So when Paul says we have clothed ourselves with Christ, he's saying that the first article of clothing that we should wear is Christ. Our relationship with him should reveal the most of who we are. It should be the outer layer, what people see, that this is our first relationship, children of the most high God, children, all of us, each and every one, not fully formed adults who are ready to move out, not that that was something that happened in the time of Paul much anyway, but children who are dependent and growing into the role, into the person of their parent, we are growing into Christ-likeness. Paul wrote this because people were clothing themselves with identities that weren't about their relationship with Christ. They were paying attention to divisive things. See, Paul writes more, speaking to known and ingrained divisions in Galatian society. Neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Neither Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male or female. Like I said, we're a long way from the Genesis story. Because these are things that have been built up, identities that have come to hold power over others, Jew over Gentile, free over slave, male over female. They were constructions and scaffoldings and structures put up to support the powerful groups, systems that reinforced and kept people in their place. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, free were all categories of society with specific roles and rights or lack thereof. But, Paul says, none of them exist anymore, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All the stuff that had been put around these rules didn't apply. It wasn't accurate. It wasn't the clothing to wear. That wasn't the first person they were, but that was what people were wearing. And it wasn't befitting of the identity of a child of God. Because they were each of them first children of God. We are each of us first children of God. Paul was writing power imbalances because it was not only the powerless person in the pairing, the women, the Gentiles, the slaves who were being given elevated roles, but the powerful ones who had to release their false positions, their 
world authority, not their God-given authority, men and masters and Jews, all of a sudden, these titles, these identities meant nothing. All of a sudden, they were secondary to everything God was doing in the world. I am first and foremost a disciple of Jesus. When we think about equality, we need to recognize that this isn't about simply telling the powerless that they are worthy. This is about all of us experiencing a hard correction of systems and structures that have been built to benefit one group over another when that is not the way of Jesus. Because yes, this is a long way from Genesis and the people of Galatia, like us, had a lot of work to do to undo the stuff they had put around each person. But there is hope because Paul continues, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. See, for all of that space in the story, God is still bringing his people together right back to the beginning, right back to his image, where each of us, all of us, heirs, those who will experience the fullness of the kingdom. The work of undoing our structures that limit or hold others back is a step towards kingdom goodness a step towards a promise we know exists, not just for women, but for each and every one of us. Thanks, Sarah, Michelle, and Christy. That was so good. Again, learning much from you. The image of God is both male and female. Together, we reveal God's full nature. God wants us to help one another in leadership to fully depict who he is. We're equal at the foot of the cross, equal to use all of the gifts God has given to us equal to learn from one another and grow from one another as disciples. Church, if we don't mentor one another, we don't disciple one another, we don't learn from one another, we will miss out on so much of who God is. So church, what step do you need to take next? There are two great books I want to recommend that have been re written recently if you want to continue the journey of empowering equality between men and women in the family, workplace, and the church. Better Together by Danielle Strickland and Developing Female Leaders by Katie Cole. Two excellent books that I've read and thoroughly enjoyed. So let's pray together. Father, my heart's cry is that every woman would be empowered to fully fulfill the call of God on her life and all the gifts. That every man would be fully fulfilled in their purpose in you, in the gifts that you've given them. And that together we could lead towards the future. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Church, I pray each of you is fully empowered by the grace and gifting of God to completely fulfill every good work he has planned for you since the beginning of time. Have a great week. Oh
Thank you, team, for that inspiring message and to our worship team for the beautiful music. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, we'd love to see you in our virtual foyer. It's such a great space. We also have virtual prayer rooms that you can access from the foyer, so join us using the links on this page. Thank you for spending this time with us. We hope you have a great week. <laughs>